Hello, my name is Pete Saronis, and I'm super excited today to be here with Tony Vicinelli and Steve Nauman. We're going to talk a bit about uh, the data center as a piece of critical infra infrastructure within our national fabric. We're going to provide some insight and perspective and answer three questions, or should I say, we're going to address three themes today. And we're super excited for those of you who are attending. We want to educate, we want to inform, and we want to enlighten a bit. Uh, but before I go into that, again, I'm Pete Saronis. I worked in the government for 25 years. I'm now the founder and CEO of a company called Dots and Bridges, which is really meant to connect dots, build bridges, and to create some light bulb moments on topics that sometimes can seem a bit complex. Today's shouldn't, but we always like to crystallize some semblance of, of what that may mean to you and why the government and industry and public-private partnerships are so important in this digital world that we live in. Today, we have our guests again, uh, Steve and Tony. Steve Nauman, he has 30 plus years of being an IT modernization strategist. Cool title. I've known Steve forever. He's amazingly talented, whether it's data center design, directing, operating, optimizing, migrating. The guy knows everything. He's well known throughout DC. He's well known throughout the country. He's well known throughout industry as an advocator and a practitioner of the data center, which is no building that, which is not a building that is just about wires and boxes, but really has become a critical component in that infrastructure. He's a policy advisor. I like to think of Steve as one of those folks that's a Sherpa, uh, call him an in-house consultant, uh, but he provides so much advice and so much insight. And by consultant, I don't mean he's getting paid for anything. I mean, he is a guy people go to for answers and insights. So Steve, we're really psyched to have you here. Um, if you read about Steve, you're gonna see that he speaks quite a bit and has a lot to offer. Tony Vicinelli is the chief, or should I say federal chief technology officer at Enlight Software. Tony as well is well known inside the Beltway and outside. He's an individual that can tell stories. You can have a conversation with Tony and never feel like it's about a buy or a sell, but it's about why something like the data center and the analytics within the data center can provide that insight, not just for government, but for industry. And we're gonna dive into a lot of uh, Tony's background, which will just come out in some of the discussion. But for the record, he is somebody that if you have an opportunity to listen to, to meet, you'll enjoy the conversation because Tony knows data centers, but he also knows the impact it's having both in our government as well as, you know, as, as it addresses uh, you know, cloud infrastructure and so forth. So today, um, before we jump in, and guys, I hope I gave you a pretty good intro. We're gonna talk about, um, just to set the tone, uh, next generation data centers, we titled it AI and the data center green wave. That'll be segment one, future proofing our IT workforce, which will be segment two, and then IT portfolio management. Um, those are the components we think will tell a good story. And along the way, we'll have a lot of anecdotes and four examples. So for those of you who are, are tuning in, um, just to set the tone, DCOI stands for Data Center Optimization Initiative. It's one of seven scorecard components that the federal government is tracking as part of its Federal IT Acquisition Reform Act. It's a law. Data Center Optimization Initiative is one that blends AI, machine learning, artificial intelligence, if you will, critical infrastructure, but it's also a part of the cloud smart strategy, which is intended to drive adoption in the federal agencies to migrate to a safe and secure infrastructure, the cloud. Each quarter agency submit a full inventory of data centers. Each year they publish a strategic plan and each fiscal year they're required to identify at least five milestones. So there is a lot of momentum behind this. And with that, that was hopefully a good bit of a quick fire background. Steve Nauman, I see that you wish you were in Greece with that virtual background, uh, but hearing all that in light of not wanting to kick it off with a, so uh, what's keeping you up at night question, Steve, in a time of pandemic and in a time we're in a virtual world, um, how are you feeling that the government's really taking this or accelerating DCOI and really looking to modernize government? Well, thanks, Pete. Thanks for having me today. So. With the pandemic, I think it's brought a lot of things to light that people maybe thought about before. We've been approaching telework for many, many years, but now we were forced over the past year to really go full force. And it's really taxing 
our networks, our data centers, and it just shows that how much we rely on data centers and cloud and all that compute that's out there to do our daily business. So what we're seeing is agencies are seeing what they have to fix. So when you overtax your system, you start to see problems in your enterprise and you address them to make sure that you have a smooth production day. Whereas before, there may be some people using all the services, but you could walk to talk and things like that. So this is really showing the need for data centers. Now we've been trying to get to the cloud for about 10 years now. And one of the things that I've always thought was funny was I, I love the term cloud. I love the term edge. Those are great marketing terms for data centers. And one of the cool factoids I've come across recently from Infrastructure Masons, that's an international data center technological group, that over the next 10 years, we're gonna have a 39 fold increase in the amount of data centers that we need to conduct our business, our wow. commerce, everything that we do. Think about it. What agency or business or organization can exist without IT anymore? We can't. So what we're seeing is not only do we have to look at things strategically and place things where they make sense for security, both cyber and physical, but we also have to make sure that the business resiliency and the service delivery is top notch. So, so Steve, spot on, and and I, I want to emphasize, folks, that um, Steve, you referenced the the criticality of this data center. This not so much anymore a building that people say that's where everything resides, but you use the word resilience. You talk about the increase in thirty nine fold. You and I often talk about critical infrastructure and folks, critical infrastructure sectors in our country, there are only 16. The data center, be it in the cloud, on-prem or in some hybrid manner is a major component of that. And Steve, we will address that throughout, but thanks for that tee up. Tony, pandemic, working virtual, you're out there in industry talking with folks up, down, sideways, north, south, east, west. The data center optimization initiative, though, I know is, is meaningful to you. You've seen this initiative mandate policy grow and, uh, you know, energy metering, virtualization, server utilization, availability, those are metrics that mean something and they are data points that can afford efficiency and modernization. But if you can take that and talk about it maybe in a bigger picture of why those are so significant and the power of what what, what DSIM is doing to help agencies not just save money, but create efficiencies and innovate? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that uh, whenever we started going down that path of uh, DCOI, right, we're, we're looking at maybe some of the, doing a gap analysis of where folks did not have or did have the ability to gather a lot of that, uh, a lot of that data, right? And so there was initially the, the, the push was, well, how do I, you know, start to tap into that uh, to, to, to meet those metrics? How do I start to tap into the, you know, my data center? What do I have available to me to, to actually make that happen? Now what we're seeing is everyone is gathering that data. Now they have, they're, they're finding not only can they meet the metrics, right? The metrics are, you know, part of that goal, but what does that mean, right? And so they're getting actionable information, actionable intelligence from, uh, that data where that, that's starting to drive decisions, right? So now they can not only see uh, whether they're, you know, meeting the metrics or not, but they're seeing, are we making progress towards that? And what does that progress mean, right? Does that progress actually mean a greater availability? Does that prog uh, progress mean I'm, there's a cost savings? Or is there a risk mitigation that's, that's involved there? And I think that's a great thing because that was the spirit behind DCOI, right? The metrics were kind of this, this, this thing to shoot for, uh, but the meaning behind that is a more efficiently run data center. Um, so, and I, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'm sorry. No, and I think people are, are uh, embrace that and are, are, are getting there, right? They, or, or are there. Um, and now that they have this treasure trove of data, they have this treasure trove of the metering that, is, that has occurred. They're like, well, let's do a deeper analysis on this, on this data. And what other new things can we find from it? What trends lie in this data that we did not uh, know were there before? 
Well, let, let's jump right into that first segment and riff off of that a bit. Back to you, Steve. You know, we mentioned artificial intelligence in a data center green wave. You use the term resilience. Sustainability is something that folks think about, you know, green energy. Well, sustainability is having a plan, a strategy for if a data center is your primary, secondary, or tertiary. Do you use, uh, you know, wired communications, wireless communications? We're seeing this become a build a resilience strategy for the data center and AI is a big part of that. Tony mentioned de-risking. So um, take a few minutes, uh, the data center landscape, de-risking and mitigation. What are some of your thoughts, Steve, on what uh, you're seeing in industry, but what could be best practices for either government or industry? Well, as we go forward and the more we try to put the cloud and become a hybrid environment, the management of that is going to be exponentially increased, more, more difficult. So think about that when you're doing your COOP and DR plans, formulating those, or when you're trying to increase the availability and service delivery, you have to account for now, instead of just being in one or two data centers, you now have to point to all sorts of different ways to get your compute. So one of the ways to counteract that or, or stay ahead of that, we still have our own data centers. And the more we put someplace else, the less efficient those data centers become, simply because we're taking things out. Data centers typically work better when they're hotter. So the more equipment that you have in, the, the, the more efficient the HVAC system is going to be and energy mm. savings and all that. So now, as we go forward with all these hybrid environments, we have to know where everything is. We have to be able to pivot according to maybe energy costs, or uh, we have weather events that may take out a, a data center or some supplier. So we have to make sure that we can manage that. And what we're seeing is the move towards more DSIM tool, more reliance on DSIM tools and HDIM tools, hybrid digital infrastructure management. So we're seeing a melding of the IT operations manager and the facilities manager into maybe one organization, one entity, or at least those two organizations working more closely together to, to provide uh, better compute at lower risk. Great points. And I wrote down a new acronym, which Tony, you get to be the person to help our folks in the audience listening. DSIM, why don't we jump into that a little bit, Tony, since you're an expert in this space and HDIM. Um, yeah. They both mean something, but they're symbiotic. Uh, uh, Steve mentioned that the reliance on, or you mentioned analytics, but whether it's through AI, through machine learning, building that resilience uh, plan is, is, I think, imperative for, for any business. So can you talk a little bit, just uh, educate folks on what's DSIM and what's HDIM? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, DSIM, Data Center Infrastructure Management, is really the first step right into getting your arms around uh, the, the, or in a, around the challenges or the issue that uh, I've got to manage all my IT assets, know where they are and the resources that they consume. And that's it in a nutshell, right? I got to mm -hmm. monitor those things. I got to mm -hmm. know physically where they are, how they're moved in and out of the data center. Uh, then the natural evolution to that is, is HDM, just as Steve said, a uh, hybrid digital infrastructure management where now there's a blurred line, there's blurred lines around, you know, even like, like Steve said, it used, you know, edge and cloud and data center were are, are different terms for the same thing. And so we need to be able to move our workloads and our compute between these different offerings, right? Whether it's cloud or whether it's uh, colo or whether it's a, you know, a site at the edge, we need to be able to understand and well, to move, but then also understand why we're moving maybe different workloads or compute to these different areas based off of those criteria that Steve just said. Hybrid digital infrastructure management helps us do that to be able to understand, uh, you know, why should we run our workloads in the AWS cloud? Uh, why should we run them, keep them on-prem? Maybe there's a, there's a privacy or a risk uh, calculation there or criteria that needs to be met, or maybe it's a cost metric, right? Those things together, uh, is where hybrid digital infrastructure management can help us answer those questions. 
Thank you. Thank you. And I love it because yeah. I always confuse that with HDMI cables. And I just think, well, it's a cool acronym. It's one yeah. of those yeah. that it's like, what? <laughs> so no, thank you. Thank you. So, so moving on to this, and you mentioned it going back to Steve and uh, the workforce, right? You mentioned uh, ops managers, facility managers. I would argue that C-level and others who are making decisions, bottom line decisions about investments and keeping the lights on. I, I used to work and run a data center in early in my career, and I appreciated how much money was spent on just power, energy, and now we have this DCOI, the DSIM tools to have those analytics to make predictive and prescriptive um, decisions. And you mentioned, of course, natural disasters that occur. So having data to fuel decision making is 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 awesome, and being resilient and sustainable. Future proofing the IT workforce, though, can you can you expound a little bit on that? Because as we automate um, a bit, Steve. Uh, we still need the human in the loop. And, and what are some of the, the roles, maybe if you can put on your visioning hat, that, that uh, those individuals leveraging the tool like DSIM or HDIM, how do you see this workforce evolving with all this data at one's fingertips? Well, in, in the past, you had a facilities network and a facility systems to run the data center. You also had the IT side of the house. Mm. Now, because of the internet of things, we're seeing a combining of that where before it was totally separate. So now when you're in a data center or in years past, you would have to be physically in the data center as a facilities manager to affect changes to the HVAC system and the electrical system, UPS, all, all that. Now you can be on your iPhone sitting at home. So the folks that used to have to go into the data center all the time will now be able to do that at telework just like the IT folks. You're still going to have to have a physical presence of the guards and cleaning people and other folks that, that take care of the day to day. But as far as all the engineering aspects and that group is now working more closely with, with the IT group. So uh, what I wanted to say uh, also about that is um, as we go forward with all this cloud and hybrid, we're going to, like I said before, we're going to have to pivot. So AI is going to play a, a, a really strategic role in this, but it's going to be, and, and it's going to be better than what we can do as humans, because if we have to quickly move uh, an environment, system, application, whatever, either because we know about it or because we have to do it in a DR situation, the AI in a data center is going to, in, in DSIM tools, it's going to be able to react quicker to those to those changes. So, so can I well let me just jump in because you brought this up in our prep calls and Tony forgive me just let me allow right, Steve awesome. to riff off this is application rationalization is something that is to me at least how you've so eloquently shared or put charged a light bulb in my brain is what do we have and what do we need in the future and where is this workforce uh, going to be best utilized. And I hear you saying that know what you have, use these tools to make decisions, but still human intuition and being strategic about whether you migrate to a cloud as your primary or secondary. Can you speak a little bit to the application rationalization component and how it all kind of ties together the cloud first? Clouds, cloud smart, forgive me. Was that to me, Pete? Yes, that was to okay. you, forgive me. Yeah, app rationalization, teeing you up to kind of talk about the importance of it. And then, then Tony, you can riff off some of that. Right, we have to be in a constant state of improvement in our data centers and in our production environments or production portfolios. So we have to get into the regular cadence and most places already are. If you've put something into production, you've made the, the, the business decision, you've gathered all the requirements that you have, you have this need, you create, the application system environment, you ask for the money, you install it, you uh, you then support it. Then at some point in the future, whatever that cadence is, you have to reevaluate, and this should be done on a, on a continual basis. And this, this is how application rationalization fully uh, supports Fatara and putting things in front of the, the, the CIO for review. So we, we go through all this and all the, all the users, will we'll we'll provide input for uh, real, real observations and real, um, um, real stories about how it's actually working in, in the production environment. And that will also help us 
strategically place these things. So if if we say, oh, it, it's going to cost uh, so much less if we put it over here in cloud A, and it really bombs out because it's it's not uh, getting the um, response times that you need, that's an input. And that's something that we can also add into the application rationalization process. Say, we have a known problem and we can use all this new information that we're getting from all these influencers of the production environment. And the user is at the, is because we have so many more users now using things uh, remotely, that's gonna be key going forward. Okay, so let's, let, Tony, no, we're going to you. Just give me a second here. Um, we're, we're talking about data centers. Um, we use the term digital factories of the future, basis for our entire economy, knowing what you have so you can migrate to and future-proof your operations. Talk about what you want to react to Steve's comments, but also I'd like you to address that while you're calling on a lot of CIOs in government because it's deemed an IT thing, I know you believe that it's about the mission and how the data center can support the mission. So why don't you go ahead and comment on what you were going to say initially, but maybe bring that into it. Oh, yeah. Well, I was just going to say, you know, through experience of trying to, you know, develop solutions for app rationalization, what, what we found was that there's data that tools can provide, but the human being in the middle to help make the decisions or determine whether or not the improvement, you know, uh, the improvement um, that they, they thought was going to happen was there. And that sort of ongoing cycle of review to make sure that, um, uh, you know, that, 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 that they're still going in the, in the right direction. As we, I'm, we're finding this, just what Steve said, right? To, you need to go through and make sure and remeasure those criteria, take new uh, variables into account and then push them through the tools that you may have available to you uh, to try to get, you know, meaningful results out of and continue to go through that, right? It's not a end goal. It's not a finish line, right? You get to the finish line and then you, and then you re-review. Cyclical. And cyclical, it's cyclical. Right? And it's cyclical, continuous improvement, right? Cyclical, but moving, hopefully, you know, up. Hopefully I'm yeah. showing up and to the right on my yeah. screen. But yes, yeah, a cyclical improvement as you go through with each iterative, iterative review. Really quick. Steve, you were going to say something. Yeah, and cyclical could mean hardware refresh cycle. It could be a programmatic refresh cycle. It could be a contractual. When we go to more hybrid uh, configurations, we're not all going to let these contracts all at the same time. We're going to be in a constant state. You may have had one contract with a data center. Now you've gone to 27 cloud providers or solutions. So that has to be worked into the cycle. And that's where AI is going to be key in keeping, helping us keep track of that. Because as humans, we won't be able to uh, fully engage in that and manage it properly. Yeah, and there's and just one pe uh, point. Go for yeah, it. Yeah, the, you know, as we have rolled out some of our AI solutions, right? We we come up with a we'll we'll come up with a set of uh, patterns or 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 models that we think that folks will want, right? And and it might be some sort of predictive analysis on temperature or power spikes. But what we find is as we start to get into you know the 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 deployment of things, people on the ground are really driving new ideas about what AI can do or what would be possible. And that's what I think is really interesting is kind of the, you know, it, it just keeps, it just keeps improving, right? We, we're trying to automate, we're trying to leverage AI to do uh, some of that predictive analysis, some finding patterns that human beings would never be able to find in the data. And it just drives in additional inner innovation. It's like, well, if you can do that, if I provided you X, Y, Z, more information, could you give me, uh, could you give me, you know, some other result? And it, it's really interesting the AI stories that are starting to grow out of this where we started and we thought industry would want things and, and where it's improved to. And Pete, just ahead, one, one thing real quick. And yeah. we as data center optimization managers can use this information now to actually push IT modernization from the data center operations vantage. So we can show that we can save energy by getting rid of X amount of data, putting that someplace else. We can take old legacy systems that are using too much energy and we can actually show real cost avoidance in our data center optimization management 
And I call that injecting yourself into the capital stream. And that can work across any sector. And people always like to hear about that. Not only can we save things by being green, be green, save green, but by fully managing with AI, the energy aspect of a data center, we can help uh, save money. And then that money can then be used for more IT modernization efforts. And I love it. And, and guys um, and folks listening, um, we're hitting on topics that are polysyllabic, we, modernization, optimization, sustainability. I want to just go back to some of our initial comment, which is that each quarter agencies must submit a full inventory of data centers and each year they must publish a strategic plan focused on consolidation. Do we need all of them? The footprint, we hear this on the Hill all the time. Um, and what is a data center? There's still a lot of that muckiness we have to get through. But at the end of the day, the spirit of DCOI and cloud smart and app rationalization, which we encourage you to read up on, they all tie together. And Steve and Tony, you know, you both understand that. But the term optimization is going to take us into this next segment here, which is where we mentioned IT portfolio management. And I think, and maybe two of the both of you can wax a bit on this, IT sometimes becomes synonymous with that's the CIO function. Well, Fatara scorecard has seven components and yes, data center optimization is one of those. And we have you know, grades from A to, I don't know what the 10th iteration was, but I'm gonna venture, hopefully nobody worse than a D, but, but it's constantly varying, which says it's constantly being worked on. So when we think about the data center as a, a critical infrastructure, as a digital factory, and the fact that DSIM is out there and HDIM is out there, what an opportunity to talk to a practitioner like Tony if you're looking to invest and maybe just pick the brain of somebody who's a superstar advisor and Steve. Uh, you have examples, Tony, of, of some of this being done in national labs and in the commercial sector. Um, can you, can you just can you address, address a little bit about how important you feel DSIM and data center optimization cannot be refined, or should I say, put in the cylinder of just a CIO responsibility. Talk to the mission. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, not only you want to know where everything is, right? I mean, you want to try to have on a daily basis, there's so much change occurring inside the data center. There's so, as, as Steve pointed out, there are so many inputs right? It's hard to get the optimal answer out of all of the inputs that are coming in as just a, just a person with, you know, a spreadsheet or a, or a set of documents that are trying to, trying to manage all those things. And so we try to provide a place, one place where you can get that, um, you know, the entire digital portfolio, right? Where are, where is my compute? Where is it, where does it live at, the, at any given moment? Because of all the all of the changes that are happening in the data center at once, the maintenance, the outages, the all of those things, I want to understand not only from a um, you know the fact that it's too hot in this area of the data center, or that I've I've lost this this uh, breaker panel, but what does that translate to in the IT service that I'm tasked to provide, right? So what does the outage mean ultimately? If you can actually put in, or what does the disruption mean ultimately? What service was uh, disrupted from that? What application might be disrupted? So, so Tony, I'm going to just jump in because this is intriguing to me and I'm, I'm going to offer a for example. The data center, the ping, the power, the pipe, the servers, the routers, the switches, the cables, they all tie to a box, folks. And that box might be in the Department of Education, for example, the student loan database or in the Department of Energy, maybe it somehow ties to analytics for emergency response on the power grid. And that's what Tony, I'm hearing you say is the data is reflective of a mission entity or a mission program or service. And I think that's where I find that this discussion and Steve, please chime in here, just because mission enabling innovation is one of the, the, the trademarks, if you will, of DSIM. Go ahead. Yeah, if I, yeah, just one last point, right? It, it is that when we say like a digital factory, like you mentioned, Pete, you're producing a product in that factory, right? That product is either some data service or some IT service or application that some end user is consuming. And so any disruption in the supply chain or the, you know, the refinement of uh, in, the, in the factory uh, is a problem and it and affects the mission, uh, that, that's all. No, no, love it. Steve, talk about that mission component. 
Right. The most important thing we have in our data centers is the data itself. Now, we have a lot of uh, emphasis on cyber and making sure people aren't hacking into applications and things like that. But I, I always try to alert people about how much data and replicated data that we have out there. We don't just have a primary and a secondary or primary and backup. We have weekly, nightly differential backups. We have quarterly, we have archive data. So there's a lot of cyber uh, emphasis on the online and, and near line and, and all that. But if I was a bad guy, I'd be looking at the archive stuff. If I can hack into a database six months old that's just sitting there in that's not live, and get that information, think about it. It may have my social security number. My social security number didn't, didn't uh, change in the past six months. The other thing about data is that the policy and legality of those images aren't keeping up with the, the tremendous amount of data that we have. Think about what we're storing in, in, in data, data centers and data centers take up the most real estate, they take up the, they need the most power, the most cooling, and that's what the bad guys are after. So that's where we always tie that to critical national infrastructure and everything that we have is about data. So it's not just the main copy, it's all those other copies that are out there that we have to be aware of. And that's where AI is gonna help us in, in a lot of ways. So before we move into parting shot, you kind of got my, my juices flowing, Tony and Steve, let's kind of have a quick fire here. We talk about critical, tying it together, critical infrastructure, DSIM tools matter, actionable intelligence, having data at your fingertips, you still have to make decisions about your investments and strategies and so forth. But I'm hearing today, us emphasizing that you have to make decisions on the ready because we live in a world, as you mentioned, Steve, with the internet of things, the industrial internet of things, everything's connected. And instead of meeting compliance, what an opportunity to innovate through the power of AI. But rationalizing your applications, which I just heard you say can help mitigate cyber slash physical risk to your enterprise. What are your thoughts on my comment I just made? I'd love to hear some feedback on that, Tony. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think you summarized it perfectly, right? I mean, being able to then also translate those those things up and down the stack, right? When it, so, what I mean by how do I respond, uh, not only from the business side, right, to say, well, this is my mission. How does that kind of trickle down into then if either physical boxes or compute that then I have to? It has to go both ways that I have to then support, right? So. If I turn, if it's, so what I think of TBM as, as the one of the ways that we can do that, right? So, so the Good technology point. business management taxonomy allows us to talk up and down that stack via one language. And Steve is probably a much better person to expound on that than I am. I'm still learning. So uh, I'm still learning how that, that all fits together. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll let Steve take it for him. But when I think about how do we you know, what is our end goal? And then what does that translate into, into the actual IT that needs to provide that end goal? I think uh, the TBM is, is, a, is a great way to do that. That is a great reference to a methodology that, that agencies are leveraging and should be. Steve? Yeah, TBM is, is a great tool to use, but in application rationalization, there's three things you should be looking at is cost, service delivery, and business resiliency. Now, if you mm. go strictly for cost, you may suffer from service delivery and business resiliency. And if you go for business resiliency and uh, service delivery, it's it may drive your cost up. But what we're trying to do with application rationalization is show where all those costs are going instead of this, this nebulous uh, bucket that the IT goes into, we can now specifically say where exactly things are going. And the TBM taxonomy is great to help us give a framework for that. That leads into FinOps, which because uh, as we go to more hybrid, more cloud, we need that information to really be able to manage our, our portfolios better. Yeah, and that, Steve, as you were mentioning, you know, the blend between facilities and IT, you know, the kind of merging of those two areas, right? They, where they were separate before, TBM seems like the place where everyone can talk, right? And understand one another to meet the end goal. Do I have that right? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. So another, another non-acronym so much, but again, those listening, 
uh, you have some homework to go see how it all ties together because it does. Okay, now we get to go to the fun part, which is really what we call, or I like to call the parting shot. Um, I'm going to give Tony you the first shot, so I'll suck a little air so you get your neurons kind of working. And Steve, you got extra time, so you really have to slam dunk it for us. Um, <laughs> uh, look, I, I, my parting shot is I, I heard and listened today uh, a lot of what, what I've been following and tracking, and you two are incredible thought leaders. I think it's a lot for folks to take in, but having worked in government, there's a lot that, that we should be doing. And it's getting up every day and eat, sleep, and drinking if DCOI is your thing. Steve, thank, thank goodness we have you, you in government to help educate and keep being the Sherpa and expert that you are. But I, I do feel like that the story for me or as the three legs of the stool, you just nailed it. Cost, service delivery, and business resiliency, Steve. Whether that's to de-risk the data center, to innovate within the data center, to decisions about tools that can help us have that visualization, that footprint, that illustration, a picture's worth a thousand words. Facts tell, but stories sell and having exemplars so that, that we can show. And Tony, you have so many of these. If folks reach out to you, maybe you wanna share the ones you've shared with me. So thank you for all of that. So there you go, Tony, you're teed up. Now you're, you better have something good to offer, but uh, parting shot, I was buddy. listening to you, I wasn't thinking. Yeah, the, uh, well, I. Pete, thank Pete, Steve, thank you so much. I always, I always learn a lot from you guys whenever, anytime we get together. Uh, but I, you know, I think that you know the I, I'm really encouraged by the space right now, the 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 openness to being able to tie into all of the data that's available, the the, the telemetry that the data center is producing, uh, and the marriage of, of of services right that are are talking to one another to be able to. Um, to be able to get, uh, you know, the re results that we want. They, you know, I've been, you know, in this space for for a while now, and it was not always the case, right? It was sort of the, you know, there was there were defined walls between groups that would talk to one another, and that is not the case anymore. The, in, the I think that people are, you know, and DCOI I think really helped drive a lot of this, which was, uh, you know, let's get IT facilities talking towards the same towards the same mission. And then once that happened, man, and, and people started to understand what the data could, could produce, uh, I'm very encouraged by the direction that things are going where people are open to discussions about, oh, this AI thing is like real, you know, it is not science fiction. We can get actionable intelligence that we would never have been able to get uh, before to be able to drive the mission and drive data center efficiencies. Um, and I, and I'm, I'm further encouraged about um, the acceptance of the, this hybrid, uh, you know, hybrid compute infrastructure, hybrid digital infrastructure, however you would want to say that. The understanding that the edges are blurred, and that uh, and that we need to be able to talk across uh, all of those different offerings. Wonderfully stated. Cylinders of excellence, silos exist, but a horizontal tapestry that is being woven through DCIM or as a result of, I couldn't agree more. It's not just the CIO, it's the CFO, the CEO, yes. the C whatever's and well stated, my friend. Steve, finish us out. Well, I hope I can slam dunk. I haven't done a slam dunk since 1990. You're tall so. enough, man. <laughs> so, so uh, you, you just made a key point, all those different factions working together. I've always said, uh, in times past, who was the first group that was always cut in a budget? It was IT. Now we are the business. There's no longer an ordinate subordinate relationship. That's one thing. So we have to work together in data center optimization management cloud and all that stuff. We also have to level the playing field with where our compute resides. So there's a lot of data centers out there that are not up to, up to uh, modern standards. The cloud providers and data center providers, colo providers, they are. So I think we have to all work towards getting those up to the same level because you never know when you have to move from one to the other, either from a weather event, a terror event, or a contractual event. So raising the awareness that data centers are part of a critical national infrastructure for everybody, government, business, it's how we connect commerce or conduct commerce all over the world. And then that also brings in all the other 
aspects of security. Everybody thinks about cyber, but think about the physical access to data centers. And that's why the guard unit or guard force of a data center is usually the, the, the biggest force because if you can spoof your way into a data center, get into a subsystem disk and start exfiltrating data, even though it's, it's encrypted, you've got something, you're data mining, and we have to be aware of that and give it the, uh, the respect that it's due. I, you know, just a quick comment on that is folks, the data center is critical infrastructure. It's where our high value assets, i.e. data live and reside and drive so much opportunity for decision, innovation, and also what we like to say is de-risking that potential for breach, be it cyber, physical security. So, okay, we're done. Uh, until next time, this is always in illuminating and enlightening for me too. So Tony, thank you to, as well. I always learn when I hear you discuss and, and we will do this again. Steve, um, you're amazing and, and the government, we need more Steve Namans in government uh, and, and uh, industry and continue storytelling and, and, and stoking the conversation. So thanks to both of you. Thanks guys. Thank you. Pete. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks Tony. Good to see you guys. Take care.